Be forewarned, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, if you see me coming on book tour for Tension City, I'll figure out a way to do a bus call because it, uh, I'll figure out a way to make it relevant. I've got a few weeks to work on how I can make that relevant, but, uh, but I will. But now, enough about me, and let's get on to the real business of this morning. Our first author is Roger Ebert, known and admired as, Amer as America's premier movie, movie critic. He began his labors in 1967 with the Chicago Sun-Times. He was the first movie critic ever to win the Pulitzer Prize. His television programs with partners Gene Sissel and later with Richard Roper were also the best of the class. His memoir, Life Itself, will be published in September. It is an honor and a privilege to present to you Roger Ebert. Good morning, everyone. You are listening to a computer voice named Alex who lives in my laptop. He fulfills my dream of being able to speak better than HAL 9000 in 2001, A Space Odyssey. But he doesn't sound as good as my wife, Chez, so I'm going to ask her to do some reading this morning. This will be from a chapter in my book about appearing on talk shows. Good morning. I'm going to um, read a little bit for Roger, but before I start, I want to just say one thing. On behalf of Roger, I'd like to thank everyone at the Grand Central, Sta Grand Central Table. This is a new relationship for him, and from the very beginning, they have been stellar, and we just want to thank them this morning. And one other thing, yesterday at the airport, it was really, it was really dicey, touch and go as to whether we were get here because of the weather. They canceled our flight, another flight was four hours delayed, and someone jokingly said to Roger, you know that guy was predicting the end of the world, do you think this is it? And Roger said, no, I have to go to the Book Expo breakfast in New York tomorrow. <laughs> so. Anyway, here we go. Jean and I were invited to appear on a TV show in Milwaukee named Dialing for Dollars. We weren't so sure. Could serious film critics appear on such a show? How would it make us look? Boys, 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 our producer Thea Flom said. Do you think the audience for Dialing for Dollars is going to be thinking about things like that? She put us through a dry run. She spun an imaginary drum and plucked out a three by five card on which she had written her own name. And the winner is Thea Flom. Jean read, congratulations Thea, you won a dollar. <laughs> we started to get other invitations. We were invited to Baltimore to appear on a morning show hosted by a young woman named Oprah Winfrey. Oprah, who was not yet Oprah, breezed into the green room to chat. I liked her. She explained we would appear after a segment with a vegetarian chef, and before the wrap-up segment would be the chipmunks performing with hula hoops. <laughs> the show did not go smoothly. While pureeing zucchini, the vegetarian chef knocked over the blender and all the zucchini sprayed all over the interview sofa. During the commercial break, Oprah covered the sofa with the Baltimore Sun and told us to sit quietly and don't rustle. <laughs> In the wings, we could see the chipmunks waiting with their hula hoops. <laughs> Oprah moved to Chicago not long after, joining the same ABC station where I'd just been hired to review movies on the news. Morning shows in those days invariably had co-hosts, and they caught a lot of criticism for risking the Channel 7 slot on an unknown young African-American woman, especially when she would be going up against Phil Donahue at the height of his popularity.
So forlorn was the AM Chicago time slot that in the week before Oprah's premiere, I was actually the substitute host. I remember in particular interviewing Sophia Loren about a new perfume she was introducing. What is the perfume made from? I asked innocently. Then I realized she had no idea. She replied, oh, flowers, you know, and things like that. Although some strange stories have gone around, it is not true to say Oprah and I ever dated. We went to the movies once. She asked me if I went to the movies all the time, and when I said I went at least five times a week, she said, why don't you take me sometime? So I did. I'm glad that was the last time he took her to the movies. <laughs> it was after that first movie that we had our historic dinner. She told me she was being courted by both King World and the ABC station group to go into syndication, but she had her doubts about King. If you fail in syndication, you're off the air, she said. It's merciless. If I go with ABC, they own stations in major markets, so I'm more protected. We were at a hamburger hamlet on Rush Street in Chicago. I took a napkin and I wrote, here's what I'm making at Tribune right now, I said, writing down $500,000. Gene makes the same, so figure on making twice that. We're on half an hour, you're on an hour, times two. You're on five days a week, we're on once, times five. You're in prime daytime, we're in fringe weekends, worth at least twice as much. $500,000 times two, times two, times five, times two. Oprah studied the napkin and said, okay, Roger, I'm going with King World. <laughs> In the fullness of time, Johnny Carson invited us on his show. We'd done a lot of TV by this time, but we were both terrified. We sat in the same dressing room for moral support. The door opened, and it was Johnny Carson, standing there, live, in the same room. We jumped to our feet. He, wel he welcomed us into the show, and then he disappeared. Roger, Jean said, you and I do not belong here. We belong at home in Chicago, watching this on TV. The door opened, and it was one of Johnny's writers. Now, Johnny may ask you for some of your favorite movies so far this year, he said. Then he left. Gene and I looked at each other in terror. <laughs> Name a movie you like, Gene said. Uh, Gone with the Wind, I said. <laughs> Gene telephoned our producer in Chicago. Will you please list some movies we like? <laughs> when Johnny retired and Leno won the late night war, oh, when Johnny retired and Leno won, the late night, war began between himself and David Letterman. There was speculation that Dave would jump networks. Gene and I were guests on the Letterman show the very evening that was scheduled to be announced, but we didn't discuss it with him. Indeed, we never discussed anything with him, apart from two occasions. Leno now routinely circulated among dressing rooms, chatting with all his guests before a show, but Letterman never did. That wasn't because he didn't like us. In fact, before Gene's death, we actually held the record for most appearances on his show. My guess is Dave waited for the starting gun at the beginning of every show and didn't believe in dissipating his energy before the red light went on. Leno, on the other hand, liked to be everybody's friend. He genuinely did like the movies. He was obsessed by them, in fact. And in the dressing room before the show, he would debate our latest reviews and usually find fault with them. Talk show guests are pre-interviewed by a writer and the host is armed with note cards suggesting questions and the expected answers. You guys are the ideal guests, Leno's writer uh, Steve Ridgway told Richard Roper and me once. Your segments always run long, he said, because Jay won't shut up about the movies. Gene and I were on the Carson show. Oh, sorry. Gene and I were on the Carson show once, following Chevy Chase, who had just promoted his Christmas release, 
The three amigos. We talked a little, and then Johnny said, Roger, what's your least favorite Christmas picture? We were looking directly at each other when he said that, and I noticed an almost invisible expression flash across his face. I knew what the answer had to be, and I believe, in that second, Johnny did, too. I paused. The three amigos, I said. There was a strange audience reaction. Audiences expect guests on talk shows to be nice. Chevy Chase saved the moment by quickly saying, Looking forward to your next picture. Carson did one his double takes and said, Gee, I wished I hadn't said that. I said, Me too. One of the reasons for the success of our show and our interest as talk show guests is that like the victims of some curse in a fairy tale, we were compelled to tell the truth. We were critics. We couldn't tell diplomatic lies. We had each other to keep us honest. There might be a temptation to say something diplomatic, but the other guy would call you on it. If I tried to talk around Johnny's question, Gene would have jumped like a wolf. Gee, Raj, he'd say, you were saying just the other day how much you hated Chevy's movie. <laughs> Neither one of us could pass up an opening. If Johnny has asked Gene the question, he would also certainly have said, the three amigos. The other time Gene and I talked privately with Letterman broke all precedent. Dave would like to talk to you in his office after the show, a producer told us. Gene got all wound up. Roger, he said, this can only mean one thing. He wants us to do a talk show for worldwide pants. As it happened, that was the night when I experienced the biggest, genuine, spontaneous laugh I've ever witnessed on a talk show. Gene was telling his story about the time he and John Wayne went into a greasy spoon at 2 a.m. and the waitress came over, saw John Wayne, and crossed herself. <laughs> what was the name of the movie he was making, Dave asked. Jism. Chisholm, Jean said. There was a moment of silence. I was sitting in the chair next to Letterman. My neck swiveled. Our eyes met. Baboom. Dave and I in the audience, and after a while, even Jean broke into uncontrolled laughter. This was a good omen for our new talk show. They'll probably want us to move to New York, Jean said, fretting. After the show, a producer took us upstairs to Dave's surprisingly modest office in Worldwide Pants. We sat in two chairs facing him. Uh, I've got a problem, and I think you boys might be able to help me. Gene smiled confidently at Dave. Dave continued, Now, you guys were both on the show we did at the Chicago Theater, Dave said. Oprah was on the same show. Remember that night? We did. Something happened that night. I don't know what it was, but Oprah has never come back on the show again, and she won't even talk to me. You know Oprah, has she ever said anything to you about it? <laughs> she never said a word to us, we said. People often seem to assume that since we were from Chicago, we all hung out together. The truth is, if you have access to Oprah, you respect it. You don't ask for a lot of favors, you don't assume. If you are my grandchild, I might be able to call one of her producers and get you a ticket to a taping of her show on your birthday, but that's about it. Okay, that doesn't surprise me, Dave said. Uh, but now how about Michael Jordan? He also won't come on my show. <laughs> and I have no idea why. Is it because Oprah said something to him? <laughs> Gene and I looked at each other. Gene was actually close to Michael, but we didn't have a clue. Right, said Dave, crackling his knuckles. That's what I expected. Okay, well, thanks for your time. Great show tonight. When people asked Letterman why he had two interview chairs, his usual answer was Siskel and Ebert. After Gene's death in 1999, David had me as a guest one more time to promote my first great movies book, and then never again. He didn't get mad at me or anything like that. It was simply that Gene and I were a double act. 
as our early producer Joe Antello told us long ago, individually, you're nothing. Together, you're stars. These days, it's not often you see Letterman needing that second chair. I thought of it as Gene's chair. He thought of it as my chair. We kept meticulous track of whose turn it was to sit next to Dave. Right now it's my turn, 